Uh, Holbrook Travel is pleased to be bringing you this webinar today, Bird in Columbia, Exploring the Country with the World's Highest Bird Count. Uh, we're joined today by Debbie Jordan and Carlos Cardona, who have both traveled to Colombia recently. They'll be sharing their experiences and talking about the country uh, as both a birding destination as well as discussing trends and key issues. Um, so they'll be going over their experiences um, and talking about some of the birds that you may see as well, some of the target species. Um, as you can see in this map, they'll be talking about some of the iconic birding regions, including places like the Santa Marta Mountains, Rio Blanco Nature Reserve, and Los Nevados, among others, um, and also some of the birds that you may see in each region and uh, some of the differences and, and the different habitats that you may experience. Uh, at the end, we'll have time for Q&A. So again, we encourage you to submit any questions that you may have for uh, Carlos or Debbie. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce Carlos and Debbie. Uh, Debbie Jordan has been part of the Holbrook team for 25 years, and after many years as a specialty travel consultant, planning and developing birding and natural history programs, she recently transitioned into a new role as our Holbrook ambassador. Uh, Debbie's passion for travel, nature, and boating have taken her around the world to 40 countries, uh, including a sailing trip from California to Florida and spending time in Costa Rica, Panama, and the Galapagos. We're also joined today by Carlos Cardona, Holbrook's Associate Director of Product Development. Carlos grew up in Costa Rica and he graduated from the Ohio State University. His early career was devoted to environmental and rural economic development work and since 2003 he's been operating adventure and community-based tours all over Central America uh, including for Holbrook Travel. So Debbie and Carlos thank you for joining us today and uh, Carlos I will turn it over to you to kick us off. Welcome Carlos. Thank you Lindsay it's a great pleasure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so why Colombia? Uh, this picture actually I love, uh, it shows a lot of iconic uh, elements to what I think about Colombia. Is uh, the, the colorful uh, lifestyle, the cities, impressive geography. And uh, my part uh, during this uh, webinar is going to be going through some generalities about Colombia, uh, why it is becoming such an um, uh, important travel destination. My guess is that most of our listeners, the audience, has not been to Colombia, um, but they probably have been to Costa Rica. And uh, I'm actually connected from Costa Rica, from Tres Rios, Costa Rica, the foothills of the volcano. So I'll be mentioning, uh, just to compare contracts, a few uh, facts about Costa Rica, just as a comparison. Um, the next slide is um, essentially the message is that Colombia today is not the Colombia that most of us grew up with. Um, Colombia today is a country that is vibrant. Uh, the safety concerns that I'm going to be discussing later on as well, just a little bit, just to get out of the way, are largely have been mitigated. Nowadays, Colombia, uh, with the two-year peace treaty signed a few years ago, between the government and guerrillas is really what I consider a really safe country, safer or as safe as Costa Rica and safer than other places uh, in this world, including the, the US. The economy, um, Colombia, uh, the economy right now is uh, booming. It's uh, the growth of middle class is impressive. Infrastructure growth, uh, uh, 2019 is expected to be 8%, which is incredible for a country of this size. The, uh, some of the investments that the country is doing that I need to mention because it does affect tourism is roads, uh, Metro in Bogota is expanding, Metro in Medellin is expanding, bridges, roads to the order of about 8 billion US uh, per year. And this goes into the 25. Uh, this is a very explicit uh, planned by the government, and it shows. Uh, for anyone that has been to Colombia, and Debbie was there, as, as Lindsay mentioned, and I was there also, I came back about a month ago, it's it's amazing what the government is doing. And uh, so uh, Colombia today is, is changing uh, rapidly. Colombia, not only is an impressive country, but, um, you know, uh, it has about... Uh, 86 indigenous tribes in the country, and uh, five regions, five greater regions, all of them very distinct. 
And you can tell because uh, in Colombia, the food is very different from Costa Rica. Anyone who has been to Costa Rica knows what food is here. It's like, it's, I call it wholesome, not necessarily uh, very uh, sophisticated. Colombia is, is to me, presents a, a whole different world. Uh, each region has its uh, specific cuisine and Colombians are very proud of that. And you can, you can tell uh, in the cities and the small towns, Colombians are very, very proud of what they're offering. And as a community, the few times that I've been in Colombia over the past three years, it's amazing the, uh, the welcoming attitude that Colombians have towards uh, visitors. Uh, the next slide as a, as a nature destination. Um, Colombia, year over year, uh, tourism is growing incredibly fast. This is, you know, causes some concerns uh, because uh, for 2018, the increase was about 38% in arrivals. Yet we need to understand that because of uh, historical reasons, no one went to Colombia, right? Only Colombians. Uh, so now that Colombia is uh, opened itself to the world, then we see that as a premier destination, especially for nature and adventure travel. If uh, in, on the northern coast, we have Cartagena. Cartagena as a colonial city and UNESCO site has always been very popular, particularly for cruise ships. Of course, that's not our business uh, and certainly not the one that we're going to be talking about. But yet, overall, in the rest of the country, every single uh, small nook of the country is, is seeing that increase in, in visitors. Again, mostly nature and birding particularly. Now, this happens because Colombia uh, is an incredibly rich uh, country in biodiversity. With only 1% of uh, Earth's landmass, it does boast 10% of biodiversity. Uh, as a comparison, uh, with about 1,900 uh, bird species recorded in the country, most, you know, highest in the world, Costa Rica has about half as much. Um, so you can just, uh, knowing that, imagine the incredible diversity of the country. It is truly, truly amazing. So why? How come that Colombia has so many birds? Is it only because it's big? Well, it is bigger, much bigger than Costa Rica. But uh, here the fact is that Colombia, because of the geography, uh, it has allowed for high uh, speciation. Um, Colombia has about 78 endemics compared that to Costa Rica, which depending on who you believe, it's between seven and 10 endemics, uh, birds I'm talking about. But even in orchids, for example, uh, Colombia has about 4,000 orchids. Uh, we, we have about half as many in Costa Rica. And uh, so it's, it's really impressive. One of the reasons for this biodiversity is that uh, Colombia, if you, look, if you think of the Andes, uh, either ending or starting in Chile and then snaking their way up north to Colombia, once the Andes reach Colombia, then they split. And um, it's actually, I call the three fingers, even though the uh, image on the uh, left looks like a claw, but it's really three fingers. And uh, so the end is split in, in those three fingers and they, ha they have created very distinct life zones. And that's one of the reasons why Colombia is so, so special. So the, the Eastern, uh, well, the Western Andes separates the highlands from the Pacific coast. That part is the uh, Pacific region, which is labeled on the right image. And then you have the central part in Colombia, which is the, the Andes, between the Western Andes and the Eastern Andes, of course, with the two deep valleys uh, that were formed by the uh, Magdalena and uh, Calca rivers. And then finally, just to mention, and Debbie is going to go into more uh, detail about this, but in the northernmost of Colombia, uh, you have both a desert, the, um, the Guajira Desert, but also uh, the, Santa Marta, the Santa Marta mountain range. And it is one of the few places in the world that you can literally be at, you know, snow-capped mountains and then about an hour and a half beyond the coast on beautiful tropical beaches. So Colombia's biodiversity is explained partially because of its unique geography. The other reason and is that because of the conflict upon, you know, for, for many years, 
then vast parts of Colombia were not visited, exploited. Uh, so right now is the time to focus on, on conservation. And again, uh, I'll be mentioning a little bit about Audubon Society's efforts in Colombia further on, but essentially uh, that's what we're, what we're here for. We're trying to portray Colombia as a safe destination and one that really needs our support to um, through tourism and uh, birding, make sure that local communities receive these benefits from, from, from this type of industry. So um, talking about that, in, in Colombia, uh, throughout the year, there's different times where we bring our groups to Colombia. But essentially, we have you know, about 150 uh, species of, of uh, hummingbirds about 200 flight catchers and about 140 species of, of tanagers. And so it's about 20% of the total species. Um, of course, Colombia being at the end gateway to South America, then in certain seasons of the year, then we have about 200 migratory species. Uh, I've already mentioned the, the 78 endemics, endemics, which is pretty amazing. Um, now, now that Colombia is, is recovering from many years of conflict, then it is the time, and we see it with investment, to develop the country. That's what the government is trying to do. And it's doing so in many ways. And one of those ways is um, uh, re uh, natural resource exploitation, uh, which is I think one of our concerns, um, particularly in, in Los Llanos, for example, which is uh, on after the Eastern Andes, it's a floodplain. Uh, some people call it a little Pantanal, uh, you know, namesake for the Pantanal from Brazil. Then um, this economic boom is also, it means also oil, oil exploration, uh, rubber tree plantations, palm oil plantations. So there are very specific, um, activities that are happening in Los Llanos that are iconic of what, has, uh, what else is happening in rest of Colombia as far as protecting these areas. Areas that um, had been quote unquote left alone, but now with this economic boom, then they're they are facing threats. I already mentioned Arban um, and Arban under the, their international alliances program Essentially, what they're trying to do is uh, establish uh, 500,000 acres of new protected areas in Colombia. Uh, Audubon, in, uh, also working with the Ministry of uh, Environment in Colombia, is helping them improve the management of uh, about 3.6 million acres of what they consider as bird habitat, uh, particularly for the flyways, right? So the, those migratory birds and, those, and other uh, endemics. And in order to do so, uh, they have been very active uh, with the government of Colombia, with local NGOs, with communities, to bring to the forefront how birding or ecotourism can support local communities as a way to improve their economy, uh, job ge uh, generation. And uh, what they have done uh, is to create essentially what they call two birding trails one is in the north one is in the central andes as a resource for organizations such as holbrook to start uh, op uh offering colombia as a destination more or less uh right now there's about 30 local communities involved of though in those 30 local communities audubon society through their aap has trained about 60 guides local guides and uh, with about 200 hours of uh, training so that uh, those local guides can do two things. Number one, work as local guides. So when our groups go to Colombia, we will have a local guide that is the expert um, in what is happening in their community or the area. And the other reason is that those local guides not only are emerging tourism guides, right? Or what we call at Hobro group leaders, but also um, they are leaders in their community um, 
making sure that the community remembers, so to say, that uh, ecotourism is an opportunity for them. Uh, so that I think is key in Audubon's work in Colombia, and it's the same thing that Audubon, as a partner with Holbrook, is, has been doing in Guatemala as well and in Belize. So, Mike uh, Audubon, Audubon has um, their slogan, birds mean business. And they really do mean business around um, around the world, of course, but it's particularly in in our flyways areas. And and the next slide um, too, I just wanted to chime in that Audubon's not just doing this on their own; they are working. Can you go to the next slide, Lindsay? Didn't mean to to hog the the mic, but um, <laughs> they are working with other partners such as BirdLife International and. So it's a whole bunch of, of different partners that that they're working together with in in these regions, and um, these two booklets are available now too. That you guys, if you would be interested in getting a, an electronic copy, we can supply that. And um, so sorry about that, Carlos. I didn't really mean to throw you uh, for a loop there by just jumping in, but um, I did want to mention that they do. Uh, they're not working alone, and it's a lot of local conservation organizations as well as um, some big international partners as well. Right. No, thank you, Debbie. Um, and and I mean, some of the stories are, are truly amazing. Um, more than once, um, I have heard how uh, the kids in these local communities, uh, small towns, the the birds, you know, uh, to them was a means of uh, entertainment, how entertainment, uh, just killing them, right, with a slingshot. And um, a lot of the work that Arabla has been doing is to turn this around, and it's not uh, you know, practicing hunting uh, with slingshots, but rather uh, uh, understanding the importance of uh, conservation and, and birds as for, for the sake of conservation, but also as a means, as, as business, as David was saying. So it is, it is truly amazing. Um, now, I just wanted to mention um, something that I referred to earlier in an earlier slide, which is about safety in Colombia. Probably most of you, uh, if you uh, subscribe to Netflix, uh, watch the uh, Narcos show. Uh, I actually like the show very much. And let me tell you something, Colombians hated the show. Uh, why did they hate it? Because they thought that it was putting Colombia under a very negative light. Um, which is true, uh, but it also reflected something that it's gone. Uh, you know, the show was based in the 80s and 90s, and that situation has changed. Interestingly enough, the Colombian government, uh, in their very effective marketing campaigns recently, I just attended a trade show, a nature trade show in Colombia. They have turned this around, and they're not hiding the fact that this happened in Colombia. They're saying this happened but we have changed, uh, and indeed it has. <coughs> Excuse me, part of the, um, the uh, milestone is that two years ago, the Colombian government signed a peace agreement with the FARC, FARC being the guerrilla, one of the, well, the, the biggest guerrilla group in the country. Um, and and it, it, it shows uh, these former uh, guerrillas, and actually I think there's a better term for that. Uh, I think they were called militants or something or other, combatants. They have joined civil society uh, uh, nowadays. They are participating in, in free elections. So I think this process has been very, very successful. And, uh, and you can tell, I mean, there's uh, generally peace and uh, in the country. Um, Lonely Planet ranked Colombia number two as the best country to visit in 2017. New York Times uh, as well this year, two out of 52. And even our State Department, uh, you know, they publish warnings every year, and Colombia was given a level two, which is the same level as UK, Belgium, France, Italy, and Germany. So uh, if we believe that going to Europe is, is uh, safe, then, well, Colombia is as safe as, as going to, uh, to Europe. So I think that was, you know, important to mention just to get it out of the way. Uh, and uh, as far as getting to Colombia, uh, there's, we have uh, uh, two very large gateways into Colombia, one being Bogotá and Medellín. David's going to mention some of that later, but it really is, doesn't take much. It's, it's uh, short flights from 
most gateways in the US. And it is a very welcoming country, no tourism, no tourism visa is needed, uh, unless you want to stay uh, over 90 days. And then as far as uh, health uh, in Colombia, it is what I consider you know, very safe health-wise. No vaccines are required. Um, based on your you know, individual conditions, then of course, you know, this is the disclaimer, talk to your doctor about it, but it is truly uh, a very healthy country. And in many cities, you can even drink the water. So just like Costa Rica. Um, having said that, um, if you decide to go to Colombia, then when, when to go, right? So the answer, the short answer is anytime. And I have been there at uh, various times in the year. And essentially, just like Costa Rica, you know, it is part of the tropics. So although we have a dry and wet season, and Colombia as well, then tropic means being in the tropic means that it may always rain a little bit, uh, you know, any time of, of the year, any day of the year. So April to October are the wetter months in Colombia, but it really, it really doesn't change much. Um, as far as birding, uh, and Debbie, you, you, you just came back from Colombia and you mentioned this, that November is uh, special because uh, it is uh, breeding and nesting time. So you'll see uh, the, uh, the chicks, uh, you'll see nesting behavior. So it is, it is a good month. Uh, normally, uh -huh. go ahead. It was just, it was great to see that kind of activity going on. And, and very special also, uh, the, other, the other times of the year, the migratory birds from October to January, and this is something that I've discussed with, with my birders, you know, your local uh, bird from the neighborhood in the States doesn't look the same in Colombia. So even the quote unquote low season months from October to January, the species that you're going to see there that may come from your neighborhood, then they're going to exhibit different behavior and they're also going to look differently. Uh, and regardless, uh, as you see, I mean, the dry periods in Colombia overall is January through March and June to mid-September, which is, you know, more or less uh, our uh, our high seasons. So, Debbie, um, you know, having said that, which is just a very brief, um, you know, uh, general conversation about Colombia, you'll take it over. Uh, you'll be talking about your recent trip, right? Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It's a great overview of um, some of the specifics about the country in general. So um, here we have a map, and this is um, also taken from the Audubon publication of the, um, the Northern Columbia Birding Trail. So you can see there are several sites on here. I was very, very fortunate to visit just one area. I um, traveled to the top part there, sort of the top left, Barranquilla and Santa Marta. So, um, and then I, so I flew into Barranquilla, and then we drove um, along the coast there and over to Santa Marta and then up into the mountains where Minca and San Lorenzo are shown as pink dots there. So um, I was just really, really fortunate to have a chance to go there. I had the privilege of hosting an exploratory group that was coming in um, on November 3rd. So I uh, really wanted wanted to go to the Santa Marta region since I first learned about it about five or six years ago. I mean, to me, it's just so incredible to have a mountain that's 19,000 feet high, right? Only 20 miles from, less than 20 miles from the ocean. So um, that was really exciting to have a chance to finally go there because I've heard all about it. Um, as it says here, there's lots of endemics in, in this region. The bad thing is the first group I ha have had ever sent there, one of their biggest complaints was, oh my gosh, that road. And the road is really bad. I mean, really, really bad. But it's so worth it. You have to go in a four by four to make your way up. And um, it it just was, it was so amazing. I, um, I'm still going. I just got back on Monday and so, I have so many pictures and it was really hard to come out with just a few. So um, I did travel the road up to El Dorado Lodge. It's about 18 kilometers from Minca, which is where the road is good up to that point. But once you get to Minca, it's, it's really, you're only going like three or four miles an hour at the most because you just, it's just rocks and washed out and 
at one time it was very pristine. It was built, uh, I was told, because of a uh, military base up there. Um, and it was really a fine road back then, but uh, the years have, have uh, really worn it away and just basically rocks in some places. So, um, Lindsay, if you could change to the next slide. Um, I can go ahead and get going on because we're kind of getting a little tight on time here. So um, I mentioned um, that I flew into Barranquilla, and the first place I went was Kilometer 4, which is on uh, – we have two programs. Holbrook has our – two standard programs, uh, the Flyways Expeditions for Columbia. We have the Northern Route, which um, does the region you just saw on the previous map, and then the uh, Central Andes, which is the one that I'm going to go over the most. But I'm just trying to quickly just give you a little taste of what I did um, on my just my exploratory trip there to the uh, Santa Marta region. So I flew into Barranquilla. We drove over uh, that long highway that basically cuts the it cuts the mangroves off from the ocean and I was told that the reason that they created this Salamanca Park was because I guess the road builders didn't really think about what they were doing to the environment so now it's a pretty sizable park this 217 square miles of um, uh, mangroves and, and marsh habitat also beaches and um, so you get shorebirds and stuff and I mentioned mosquitoes here because it's the only place in the entire itinerary that I encountered any mosquitoes. Uh, I was pretty shocked by that, that I really expected it um, at some of the lower elevations, but none except here, but it wasn't too bad. So the next, the next uh, slide, please. So this was one of my first birds. The kilometer four is just on the road that goes to, um, that goes over to Santa Marta. And uh, this russet puffer was just sitting there. It's kind of like a little farming community. Uh, was excited to see this guy. I love puffbirds because they sit still for a long time and don't fly away, and I can get pictures of them. Um, we also saw a snail kite and cattle tyrants on a horse, some black neck stilts, chicanas, and other um, birds. We saw just in, you know, we saw 16 species in 30 minutes. So uh, we also got to see the Caribbean and great tailed grackles there. Uh, so the next slide. So this is Christian, Christian Daza, who was going, he's the guy that was leading our group as well, but he met me in Barranquilla, and then we had a driver that, that took us up to the uh, Santa Marta. And so anyway, you can see a beautiful boardwalk. The government has spent some money on this park and uh, really made it a nice, really nice um nice place to visit and you're quite up close to the birds. You can see there's the, the pond water right there. And so some of the birds that we got to see an American king, American pygmy kingfisher that was about six feet away in dense brush, but it was amazing. So Christian is amazing too. He uh, is only 26 years old and grew up in uh, Otun Kimbaya and really started his birding career at about age 10 where he was, um, you know, working with his dad in, in the park there. So really amazing guy, very, um, everyone fell in love with him. We also saw other birds like um, the Pied Water Tyrant and the Pied Puffberg and Kokoi Heron here. So this is also part of the boardwalk and you can see the, the swampy areas. So next slide. And one of our old friends here in the States, um, the prothonotary warbler, and we don't get them like that here in Florida, so it was really nice to see this beautiful bird. So next. So we traveled the road. Uh, took us about three hours to go, 18 kilometers. Like I said, you can only go about three or four miles an hour, and you're crossing over lots of waterfalls and just boulders and I, I'm telling you, the the driver's so good though, amazing. So this is um, El Dorado Lodge and that was just the dining room and a welcome cup of coffee. I got hooked on Colombian coffee. I don't think I'm going to be able to drink any other kind of coffee after this because it just was so fabulous everywhere we went. The lodge uh, was built by Pro Aves. It's their flagship lodge. That's a, it's been around for quite a few years, but um, this is the main building there on the right that's got the dining room and an observation uh, area deck. And um, I'm kind of standing over by one of the sets of feeders, but the feeders were just spectacular here. You can see uh, she's 
quite close to them. I mean, the hummingbirds are all around you. And I mean, cell phone pictures, you can go to the next one. Uh, they had banana feeders as well as, as plenty of hummingbird feeders. But uh, these little guys, oh my gosh, I couldn't get enough of them. The blue naped chlorophonias are just so, so beautiful. And I was so thankful that they weren't in cages because my first bird in, you know, that I saw at a restaurant in Colombia was in, um, was a beautiful saffron, actually two saffron finches that were in two separate cages right there in the restaurant. And, you know, so they do capture the birds and use them as pets, which I hate to see them cooped up in those little cages. But as you can see, they share the feeders and um, of all of the hummingbirds that are flying around, this is a cell phone picture, by the way, on the left, that guy was like, maybe less than two feet away from me but they're buzzing your head and uh, just flying in and out all over the place it's really fun to um, take videos of them and especially in slow motion but interestingly enough uh, this was the case in some of the other places too the birds there was only four different species of hummingbirds there the, the sparkling violet ear that you see in the picture and uh, brown violet ear lazuline saber wing and crowned wood nymph so of all those birds, they, they do share, though, that's one thing. There, I think there was eight or nine birds on that one feeder once they all finally settle down and quit trying to chase each other off. Um, this guy here on the right is a band-tailed guan. They are also, they've got their bananas, like, underneath um, underneath chicken wire to keep these guys from just taking them and hauling, hauling them out in the forest, and um, at least we get to see see the birds coming in to eat them. So... This is the view from uh, from the lodge there, and uh, you know the clouds cleared off. And the next picture kind of shows what it looked like uh, at dusk when so some of the lights are coming on. That's the peninsula we came across. Way out in the distance is Barranquilla. So you drive across that um, that spit of land, which is where the Salamanca Park is, and then you have the town of um, oh, the town is called Cienega Town. And then um, just towards uh, that bush there on the right, that is Santa Marta town. So you can also see Santa Marta there, which is where uh, there's big freighters anchored off there. That's a, another big port for Colombia. So the next slide. So the next morning, we're up at 4.30, and we the road gets worse. So um took us another eight kilometers, which took an hour and a half to go on that part. But boy, was it ever worth it when we got up there. Christian is taking a picture of what you see on the left, and that's the, um, the highest peak there in the mountain range. There's a glacier on top, and it's um, pretty pretty darn beautiful. So next. So yeah, just all kinds of bromeliads everywhere. And I mean, I tried and tried for pictures of the road. It's really hard. to It doesn't do it justice, but uh, just trust me, it's a little lurching back and forth, but uh, the 4 by 4 vehicles handled it quite well, and uh, they did great. So um, there is a military base even further on up the road, so you can see the road kind of narrows down even more, and those uh, just motorbikes can go through there. But So we took a box breakfast up, with, up there with us, and um, these little guys, the Santa Marta brush benches came right out looking for handouts. I mean, they're almost, I thought they were going to hop onto onto the hand of the guy with the crumbs. So, um, so that was kind of neat to see them up close. Next. So this is just one of the waterfalls. So this is us making our way back down. But uh, as you can see, it just spills right across the road. And, of course, the thing gets washed out. And this handsome young man here was our driver's nephew. Uh, we stopped along the way at, at their house uh, to drop something off as we were going by. And I was like, what in the world are they doing living out here in the middle of nowhere on these really steep hills? But they're growing coffee and, you know, eking a living off of the land. And, you know, it's just... It's a it, it's an amazing life. I mean, it, it, they they live a very clean, um, good food and and good people area. So it was really nice to have a chance to meet his family. Next. Okay. So now into the meat of what we did as a group. So um, our trip, really the um, the Holbrook trip that we have, the Flyways Expedition, really focuses on 
um, the region, the Risaralda Department and the Southern Caldas Department there. So it starts off in Medellin, and um, you can stay on the map for a second, please, Lindsay. And then um, we do two nights at uh, the Rio Claro Reserve, two nights at Termales del Ruiz, which is up in the Paramo, very high elevation, and then two nights at Otun Kimbaya, um, a really wonderful reserve, um, and then back to Bogota and then out. So it's only it's only an eight-night program, which is a really comfortable amount of time. And that's what you can go to the next one now. Um, our itinerary actually um, was about similar amount of nights. We saw 350 species. We saw 42 of the, I think it was 42 species of hummingbirds out of the 147. So if you like hummingbirds, it's a great place to go. So the the lodging in Medellin is at La Extremadura, it's overlooking, kind of, it's up in a neighborhood overlooking the, the valley where Medellin is located, which I've never seen so many high rises in my life. Lots and lots of prosperity here because construction is just crazy. I mean, cr just all kinds of stuff going up. And of course, our group um, was very experienced uh, group of birders, and these are longtime leaders, mostly um, uh, folks that have traveled with us for many years. It was a, a special delegation of photographers and birders on this exploratory trip. So always birding, always birding. So that was a lot of fun. We had a great time. So next, that's our comfortable bus that we were in. So the site just outside of, of Medellin is La Romera. This place is wonderful for, um, uh, it's actually a, a lot of local people come up here for bike riding and uh, it's, it's just a nice little recreational area that's just outside of um, Medellin. And we saw the red-bellied grackle, that's really the target bird here. And um, the only place that I got bitten by something, there was just little tiny little sand net kind of bugs there that put an itching on you. But um, other than that, the whole rest of the trip, no, no problem with bugs at all. Next. So, um, so as I mentioned, the itinerary, the day you start in Medellin and then uh, travel to Rio Claro Reserve, it's about three hours. Actually, all the travel time on this, this program is somewhere around three, three hours between point A to point B. And so it's not, it's not uncomfortable. Uh, this is uh, birding at Rio, Rio Claro. It's um, sort of a long, it's a quite big reserve that's right along a beautiful river that's used for rafting and other recreation, but uh, fabulous birding around there. And what birders don't like to have ice cream, our driver went and got everybody ice creams to, to eat. So they're enjoying that little little break there. This place is pretty rustic, um, the most rustic of all of the, the hotels on this program. Uh, there's no hot water there, but you can skip to the next slide, please. And you can see the rooms are simple with mosquito netting. There's no screens, but um, very comfortable. Uh, you know, fans, they have fans in there. It's electricity. So um, great, great birds around there. Though. And just walking along the road, we didn't even really have a chance to go to the trail on the trails. But there's a trail that goes along the river that's well paved, or well paved, I say. But it takes you out to the, you can go out and see the oil birds coming out of the cave down there, which was an amazing experience to see that um, just after dark, they like a thousand of them start coming out of this cave. It was incredible. Next. So then we were off to the high elevation of, of Nevado del Ruiz, which is um, the lodge is like down in that valley there. The It's a thermal hot springs area. So there's, it's very comfortable. This elevation next, that's a, a Rufus Collar Sparrow there. They're pretty much everywhere. We the little roofies are um, ubiquitous, as well as the great thrush. We, I started calling them the, the ubiqu ubiquitous thrush because they pretty much are everywhere. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the Los Nevados National Park, this area up here, the visitor center is at about 13,500. The bird to see here is the Buffy Helmet Crest. The interesting vegetation around there is just so, so different. You're really high up in the in the Paramo. Next, 
uh, my picture of the Buffy helmet crest unfortunately had a um, uh, a read that went right. I mean, it didn't come out, so <clears throat> I don't have one to show. I'm, Photoshop is is coming to help that picture, but they're right there. They're just um, working around in the uh, in the bushes just right outside the visitor center, so they were very easy to see. We got good looks, and they're very big hummingbirds, by the way. So next, uh, another um, star of the show up there is the many striped castanero, and and uh, I know the name of these trees, but I can't think of it right at the moment. So we got to keep moving. Let's uh, go to the next one, please. This is uh, the the hotel and uh, they have two thermal pools, one behind the hotel, this one that's out in their expansive gardens. Just spectacular scenery. We were treated to lovely weather and uh, and then uh, just the first several hours of the morning and then it kind of fogged in, all that fog came in and sort of started raining, but we had beautiful views. Next. Um, this place uh, on in comparison to the um, Rio Rio Claro is definitely more upscale, has a heater in there, which is needed. And uh, this land around here is a uh, farm for dairy uh, cattle, and they actually have like little milking stations where they collect the milk and then bring the bring the uh, the milk out on horseback. Next, super steep as you can see. I don't know how the cows hang onto those mountains. Um, the feeders there were also quite um quite impressive too as far as the closeness of the hummingbirds and this is one of our targets and and i write his i i i the name is escaping me at the moment but on to the next one and the sword billed hummingbird that bird is incredible that big long bill I don't know how they can even fly with that, but we got that was very close up too. They're they're pretty acclimated to people, so photography, the photographers were just in heaven. Next, and uh, then uh, the itinerary goes to Rio Blanco, which is where they feed the ant pittas. So you have very good chances of seeing ant pittas in this region, but. Also, once again, hummingbird feeders, just they just come out of the woodwork. This long-tailed sylph did not disappoint, and, and just so many, many opportunities for pictures, thousands of pictures. And then here's our favorite little ant pitta that uh, is, I noticed that we had some slides from another traveler uh ian slides and it looks like the same bird i don't know if it is or not but uh the guide there on the right the gal on the left she um she they go out and collect worms and then they they sort of invite them up to come and get the worms so people can have a look otherwise you would never see them because they're super skulky and secretive and out in the bush so we're standing there waiting for for the ampitas next uh, now, Otun, yes, we. Um, this is one of the benefits of of being with a, a tour company that uh, that has partners that we can fix problems in the field. We found out um, the day before we were to go to Otun, Kimbaya, that uh, they had a terrible storm and actually really bad flooding in in the area. And uh, Christian's house, actually, they his parents had to evacuate into the city of Pereira just because they didn't have any power and so it was pretty um pretty bad but uh, it caused us to to miss this wonderful reserve which I feel bad I just have to go back so next so here are some of yes yeah, some of the species that you can see there but um we uh we also have good opportunities at this site to meet with community members, which is uh, a, a fabulous part of the program in, in order to get to know some of the local people working on conservation. Next. So then uh, you fly back from Pereira, which uh, Otun is outside of Pereira, and fly back to Bogota on the itinerary uh, this park is the airport is just right th right there not far away from um from these ponds we didn't get the bogota rail but uh they are indeed out there and we are um 
were listening to them here where there was a pair calling out there, but they never did come out. So um, we missed it this time, but maybe when you go, you'll get a chance to see them. Next. So, yep, this is um, just talking a little bit about Bogota, and I mean, you can read a little bit about it. Since we're running so short on time, I wanted to make sure we have enough time for questions, so we can just kind of skip that and move on to the next slide, Lindsay. All right, so this is one, just one of the groups that are uh, going next year, and in the prime time, uh, they're doing the itinerary that I just spoke to you about, and you can find this on the website. And we hope that you'll consider organizing your own group to go to Columbia. And um, it's very easy. One of our consultants can just assist you with uh, putting together some dates and getting a group together. We can help advertise. We can definitely assist you with uh, marketing materials to spread the word. And uh, we've got lots of experience if this is your first time organizing a trip. Great. So, Wonderful. Well, ahead. thank you so much, Debbie uh, and Carlos as well um, for sharing your experiences and, and uh, talking a little bit about Columbia as a birding destination. Um, as we are a little short on time, I'll try and keep it brief, but we do have a few questions that we've received. Um, and if we don't get your, to your question today, um, you're certainly welcome to uh, reach out to us or, or we can try and get in touch with you. And, and if there's anything specific that you are wanting to find out, we can, we can definitely communicate with you. Um, but uh, just to sort of kick it off here, um, we do have one question, Debbie, that's asking about the minimum amount of time that one should plan on a birding trip to Columbia. Do you have any recommendations for that? Um, I would probably not go for anything less than eight nights, even though the flight is pretty close from Miami. I was surprised how short it was really only about three, three and a half hours, I think. And so one of the things we were talking about on our group is maybe, um, trying to spend maybe a little bit longer at each site with maybe three nights instead of two. So, you know, we were talking about potentially developing a program that would just be a little bit slightly shorter, you know, maybe only six or seven nights at the minimum, but just so you could sort of spend time uh, and and get to know a place better. Sure. Okay. Um, we also have another question asking, um, out of the different regions that we talked about in the presentation, is there uh, are there any places that would be best or better for first timers to Columbia, people who have not been to Columbia before? Mm, you want me to take this one, Carlos? Uh, I would say that the Central Andes uh, program is very iconic. And um, it is, you know, everything is close by. And uh, you have access to the Paramos, which, by the way, those those trees, uh, they be, they're Fred Lejones from the Spelesia family. And um, yeah. Colombia does happen to have about 40% of the world's Paramo ecosystem. Uh, it shares it with uh, some parts of Peru and actually in Costa Rica, we have Paramo as well. Paramo being the tropical equivalent of, uh, you know, alpine ecosystem. But in, in the central Andes, then you have access to that. You have lower... I would completely agree. I think that's uh, the most concise way. I mean, the distances are far between the big cities and so uh, the fewer flights involved too is going to help your cost uh, stay lower. Right. Um, that also kind of ties into the next question and Debbie you touched on this a little bit with some of your experience but can you talk about can either of you talk about the ease of getting around the country? Um, uh, I know obviously as you mentioned Debbie there are some some uh, roads that are maybe uh, a little rough to get around, but in general, is is the country pretty easy to get around? I would say absolutely yes. Um, we w traveled on one road, though, that was very windy and um, going down, down, down when we were on our way to, um, and, you know, there, we got stopped a few times because there was a, a couple of trucks that rubbed each other, and so the road was blocked, but you know what? birders do they get out of the bus and start birding and so we made good use of the times that we um, we had to stop because of um, some fender benders and I mean I couldn't believe some of these <laughs> some of these trucks it was like this huge auto carrier a big long giant thing going up this tiny little windy road it's I don't know <laughs> 
but it, there are um the, so there are certain highways that are easier to travel than others but and of course bogota is very famous for its traffic and, and taking forever to get to, from point a to point b just because of congestion so but you know for the most part the roads are actually quite good it's just in these in the high elevations and um then four by fours are provided for those days Okay. And, and for that, I think that'd be the, you know, we always make it very specific. I mean, getting to El Dorado is, as you mentioned, heinous, right? It's worth it. Yeah, but also in, in the other Paramo regions, too, it's to be expected that you're going to have bumpy roads getting up in the yeah. high, high places. Um, for the two different itineraries that we talked about, um, can you talk a little bit about what the different elevation ranges are? Um, how, how high elevation are we talking about? Uh, in the central Andes, in the Nevado area, is really the highest point of all of, of of the areas that we visit on our programs. And as I mentioned, the highest there being at 13,005. That's where um, the visitor center is. The hotel itself is at 10,005. But I um, have to say, as someone who suffers from altitude sickness, I have found the miracle drug um uh one of our participants recommended it call it's called dexamethasone and i had my doctor prescribe it and i didn't experience any troubles at all which i have been sick in cusco two times the two times i've been there <laughs> so i um am very thankful to have found that as as a cure and, and none of no one on our group really experienced any issues you know and, and going up slowly does also help too so Bogota is at about seven thousand or eight seven to eight thousand, I think it is, something like that. So you're you're already starting to get, you know, most of the country is anywhere from, you know, the low the lowest being like around a thousand feet at, at Rio Claro, maybe a little less than that, you know, all the way up. But most of it is in the middle range. The only highest point uh, Santa Marta is about 7,500, 8,000, kind of like um, Savegra in Costa Rica. Okay. Um, we also have someone who'd like to know um, if either of you have a bird field guide that you recommend uh, for preparing for a trip to Colombia. Yes, we do. It is the, um, of course, <laughs> I should have this off the top of my head, but it's the field guide to the birds of Colombia. Um, it's a really actually a great book. We um, we used it. Uh, several people brought it along and um, highly recommended. It's not cheap, but and it isn't light. I don't know why they don't make field guides light. There are a few apps out there also. One is um, uh, published by a UK company. I think the cost is somewhere. I think I was told that it was like 25 euros or something like that. So not free, but also quite good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we also have someone who'd like to know, uh, what if you're not an avid birder? Can you still participate in a trip such as this, or would you would you still get enjoyment out of a trip such as this? We had a lot of people that were interested in a lot of other stuff like insects and uh, plants. And, you know, if you're setting it, you can, we can customize a program to follow your interests. So if you're not into birding as much as uh, as the rest of the group, you know, you might be kind of bored because we're sitting around waiting for a bird, but you don't have to participate in all the activities. You could stay back at the lodge, for example, and just hang out in the gardens or take a dip in the thermal pools or um, do other activities. But it's not really any different than any other country as far as, um, you know, having other options. There, There are indeed other options. Okay, great. Um, I think we have time maybe for one or two more questions. Um, and then if we didn't get to your question today, um, again, we'll we'll try to get in touch with you personally uh, to see if we can help provide the information. Um, we had one person who asked, um, do participants need to bring their own sp scopes? No. The guide will have a scope and is really adept at using it. Click on the draw. <laughs> no need to oh. carry that. I mean, unless you really want to. Okay, great. So people can bring their own scopes, obviously, if they if they wanted to bring their own personal mm -hmm. uh, equipment. Okay. Um, right, and but then these last... guides know right where to look and 
they hear it or see it so quickly, you know, your chances, uh, you might as well just use his scope. That's the way I look at it, but <laughs> everyone's <laughs> different. Um, and then lastly, um, how easy or difficult is the bird photography in Colombia? How hard is it to, to get good photos of the birds? Oh, even with my little camera, I got some great shots. I mean, I just included a few. I mean, there I took a bunch, and I just have a, like an advanced point and shoot. But we had people with really high end cannons that were just getting amazing, amazing pictures. And uh, these days, you know, it's it's actually it was fairly open. I mean, most of our birding we did from the road, so it's not only a couple of times did we really go into dark trails and. So I'm, um, you know, they they have really amazing pictures. I can't wait to see them. We're just, like I said, some people aren't even back yet, but um, we will be sharing those hopefully. Uh, I plan to actually do more of a gallery as well and, and, and a, blog, a blog post so we can get a little more out there because it's very picturesque and fabulous birds, just beauty, beauty, beauty everywhere. Oh, that's exciting. Well, yeah, we will be staying tuned for those photos. Thank um, you so right. much. Well, yeah, thank you, um, Debbie and Carlos, both for, for joining us today. Um, with that, we'll be concluding our webinar. Uh, again, I'd like to thank Debbie and Carlos for joining us and for sharing their expertise. Uh, and also thank you to all of you who attended uh, and also to those of you who submitted your questions. Um, uh, again, if we didn't get to your question, we will try to, to contact you and, and hopefully be able to answer everyone's questions. Uh, we do hope you, that you found the presentation interesting and informative. Uh, the webinar today has been recorded, so we'll be emailing everyone a replay of the webinar in case you want to watch any of the parts uh, that you may have missed. Um, and we'll also be including links to those two documents that we mentioned early on um, for the Audubon uh, uh, booklets that uh, we have the electronic links to. Um, and I so, can give you the authors of the field guide too because it, I'm blanking on it. I apologize for that. So we'll okay, so we'll make sure that. to include those as well. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.